Uh, welcome to Barstool Pick'em Week 15 NFL. We have a very special guest this week. Dave is out chasing Chrissy Teigen at God knows where. So in his place, we have an actual Vegas expert, Todd Furman, who is, uh, you can find him on Twitter at Todd, at Todd Furman, and you can find his blog at, at or Todd'sTakes.com. Todd, welcome to the show. Thank you for actually coming here and giving us some real wisdom instead of usually what we talk about. You know what? I appreciate the invite on. I won't claim to own racehorses like Portnoy. I won't claim that I've put my gambling on sabbatical until an indefinite date. And so hopefully we'll be able to shed a little bit of wisdom on this week 15 NFL card. But uh, I will not get in a fight with Chrissy Teigen over the course of this podcast, Big Cat. Thank you for that. And just so you know how this works, if at any point you don't feel like you have like the inside, you know, word on a team or you just don't want to talk about a team, all you have to say is they stink and we kind of move on. <laughs> we just do like like we'll just be like, oh, yeah, that team stinks. That team stinks. Give me that team. So that's really so the me- extent of our analysis. And so, Big Cat, that means we're not talking about the Monday night game at all then because I don't want to see a grown man break down in tears talking about his beloved Bears. Oh, God. We'll get to that. But, yeah, it's a dumpster fire. So let's hop right into it. Um, We're going to start with the Steelers and the Falcons. The Steelers are minus two uh, at Atlanta. Over-under is 55 and a half. My gut, which always sucks, says take the over and take the Falcons because I don't know who the hell the, the Steelers are. What do you, who do you like in this one? No, this game uh, is going to be real interesting. Of course, major injury concerns for the Falcons if that's the team you want to try and get behind. Julio Jones hasn't practiced most of the week dealing with that hip pointer he suffered against Green Bay. I think we'd all be a little bit injured after running through that Green Bay secondary for the tune of about 250 yards like Julio was able to do. You look on the defensive side, Atlanta, as you talked about the Bears being a dumpster fire, that's the Falcons' defense this year, and it's going to be real difficult for them to try and slow down the Steelers. I think when you look at this game, though, know, this number is going to keep ticking closer to pick them, especially if Julio's in the mix. And Atlanta seems to be the side. They've thrived as a home underdog in the thick of a playoff race, but I do think both teams can score, so I'd agree with you. Make a strong case for going over the total and a very slight lean towards Atlanta here as a live home dog. Now tell me quickly because so I'm Todd and I uh, had a beer last week when I was in Vegas. Todd's based out of Vegas, and and I asked you how many over unders you usually take, and you said you usually take twenty eighty percent unders, twenty percent overs, which is the smart thing to do. I am like ninety nine point <laughs> nine percent overs. Would you say like in terms of an expert perspective, taking an over in the fifties in the NFL? That's just crazy, right? Well, I mean, it's become such a different game over the last couple of years. I mean, you've seen scoring trends start to increase. Years ago, you saw a number of totals in the mid to low 30s consistently. Uh, And now 55, 56 with these high-powered offenses isn't as daunting a task to try and go over. Uh, I will say, Big Cat, from you talking about playing overs and unders, yeah, about 80% of my action does come in under. The one thing, thankfully, I've been uh, able to stay away from is the trend we've seen on Sunday night where the total's gone over. 12 of the 14 games so far this season. Uh, But this spot on Sunday afternoon, I think both these teams will be able to score. And it's amazing. Even a low-scoring game at the end of one, or even at halftime with the Steelers-Bengals, you saw the Steelers hang 30 points after the break last week. Yep, and that uh, that Sunday Monday night over thing is like you know it's I I say it's kind of like golf when you when you shoot like 115 and then on the 18th hole you hit like a beautiful like nine iron from 90 yards away to the pin and you're like oh I could play this game so I just get killed <laughs> all weekend and then Sunday night comes around I hit the over and I'm like oh man this is so easy I got this figured out but. That's my own my my own problems. Uh, let's move on. Redskins Giants. This game, the line doesn't make sense either way. The Giants shouldn't be favored by seven against anyone, and the Redskins shouldn't be a seven point dog against anyone. So, do you just say no way am I betting this game? Uh, well, when you look at a divisional game, and we've seen it from some of these teams that are dead and buried so far this season, they tend to rise up to the occasion. You only have a handful of games and you're playing out the stretch outside of the playoff race. Uh, And I really believe you've seen the infighting this week, highly publicized going on at Redskins camp. Colt McCoy upgraded, obviously, to the expected to start role here instead of RG3. They'll get Deshaun Jackson back, and I think that was the major difference against the Rams last weekend. They had nobody to stretch the field that allowed St. Louis to play the game in a 15-yard box uh, and really eliminate the running game that the Redskins leaned so heavily on. 
The Giants, I mean, they were terrible up until last week, but apparently the Titans are the perfect cure for anything that ails an NFL side. Going to be much more difficult against the same Redskins team they embarrassed on a Thursday night earlier this year. I like the dog here, but this number may tick closer to seven before the professionals get involved. You're talking about three out of every four bets coming in from the general public uh, on the favorite here on the New York football giants. That's, I mean, that's crazy. I'm going to take the over again. So that's two for two on overs. So you're by the end of this uh, podcast, you're going to be like screaming at me, but that's just, I'm just giving you. We'll drum it into your head eventually. I mean, it almost felt in a day, big cat. It's going to take a little (laughs) bit of time to indoctrinate you to this under, uh, you know, this under approach. I can't do it. Uh, All right. So moving on dolphins, Patriots, Patriots are minus seven and a half best team in the league in your mind in terms of your power rankings are the Patriots the best team in the league you know what they're right up there I won't say there's a they're the best because I think it's a bit of a log jam right now I'll make oh, sure. oh, oh oh Todd this is barstool sports you can't sit on the fence right, I can't I, I can't team. vacillate I can't go back and forth uh, no. I'll say the Patriots right now are the second best team going in the NFL with the opportunity to try and ascend to that top spot especially given how dominant their defense has been okay so now he, next question if you look at the Patriots, the last three games, this is their only game that they're going to kind of like, that's kind of a trap game for them. The Dolphins are probably their only last, you know, barrier to that uh, home field advantage. Because I think they play at, at home versus Buffalo and then at the, at the Jets. So do the Dolphins have any chance going to Foxborough? Uh, normally you'd circle this game and you'd say, hey, I want to bet the Dolphins here, especially as an underdog of seven or more. But the reality of the situation is that team is so banged up. Uh, You saw them get absolutely dominated on both lines of scrimmage for the better part of three quarters last week uh, at home against the Baltimore Ravens. And it's rare for New England to have revenge within the division. You have to imagine if the Patriots had a game circled on their calendar aside from, you know, the big games. Uh, This had to be one since week one when they put together one of the worst halves of football we've seen the Patriots play aside from that entire debacle in Kansas City. And so I think when you look at this particular spot, uh, New England's going to want to come out and make a statement, prove that that was a fluke, keep that momentum going, uh, and the numbers don't lie with what you've seen from Bill Belichick. I know these are straight-up trends more than anything else, but the Patriots 25-5, and their past 30 divisional home games, and 26-2 and straight up, their past 28 December home games. And in the NFL, if you think a team can win outright, you make a strong case for laying the points, especially if this number does tick towards a touchdown. Uh, I like the Patriot here, Patriots here. It's laying the lumber pass. So what you just said just screams to me that this is your first leg of a tease. Perfect. Yeah, uh, I mean, I right. think, yep, the Patriots make a ton of sense uh, on a teaser. You know, if you get them down to basically a pick them, uh, you can wheel them with a number of other attractive legs out there. A couple live underdogs, but I know we'll get to those in a few minutes. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll find the second leg of that tease, but everyone can circle the Patriots as the first leg of their tease. <laughs> uh, Raiders and Chiefs. Chiefs are minus 10. Raiders, so we have a theory here that when you bury a football, your team changes. <laughs> and now I, I, I didn't realize this theory until, until this year, but it's clear that the burying of the football, it takes – a while for the tree to grow. So he buried the football and now the football tree is growing and the Raiders have won two out of the last three. Do you buy into that at all? Um, I'm not sure how burying a football works, but I mean, maybe in Chicago, you guys should be burying a head coach if that's what it'll take to resurrect a franchise. So we would love to, but no, I'm serious. This is a, a dead serious question because from like a degenerate average Joe guy, like Dave and I, when the Raiders buried that football and then they played the Chargers, we were like, you have to bet on the Raiders because they buried a football. Do 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 people in <laughs> Vegas, like the experts, do they laugh at people like us? Or are they like you like do you put in like a half a point for burying a football? No, I mean you're trying to find the intangible edge, and judging by how well the Raiders have been uh, against the number this season, maybe burying a football is worth a lot more than that. I won't say it's worth a full field goal. Uh, but you're talking about something that more NFL franchise apparently need to adopt. Now, of course, that didn't work so well when they went to St. Louis and got beat like a drum 52 zip. Um, but Oakland had Kansas City's number on that Thursday night, broke into the win column, celebrated like they were a number one seed in the college football playoff because I would say an NFL playoff team, but Oakland's not quite anywhere close to that. And for all the degenerates out there that want to hang their hat on trends to validate a play, this is your game. The Raiders are 11-3-1 against the spread at Kansas City since 2000. The Raiders are 20-5 against the spread. 
their past 25 divisional road games. They're 14 and three against the spread as double digit dogs since 2007. And Kansas City only two and nine against the spread, their last nine divisional home games. So how's that for numbers? Can make a case for Oakland. Unfortunately, the professionals laid the nine and a half with Kansas City. So, so all the all the all the pros are taking the Chiefs. They're looking. They think Kansas City gets back to basics here, and Oakland's going to have a hard time competing with this team for the second time. Oakland hasn't been great in back-to-back weeks. I mean, we saw them follow up a win with a clunker, uh, and then you know they had a big win against San Francisco. Wouldn't really shock me if they didn't get off the bus here. You also just gave us more stats in that one game than we've had in the entire uh, 14 weeks prior. So thank you for that. I like the Steelers are going to be spinning. They're going to be spinning from all those numbers. <laughs> Trying to raise the bar a little bit. You know, uh, you put me in the hot seat here. I have to make sure I can live up to El Presidente. So uh, I got to throw out numbers because I don't have the great stories about the industry that he does to keep people entertained. True. Uh, All right. So Texans and Colts. Colts are uh, a touchdown favorite. My first question to you. If Ryan Fitzpatrick went to San Diego State and not Harvard, would he be in the NFL right now? (laughs) Uh, I, I'm not sure because uh, I don't think he can throw a forward pass much better than what we saw out of Ryan Lindley in relief duty for the Arizona Cardinals. So Fitzpatrick makes a great story, and, and Big Cat, we can't really trash a guy that would have dwarfed our Wonderlick score. You and I combined but, might be able to get close to what Fitzpatrick did on that test. He's not an NFL quarterback, and because he went to Harvard, everyone wants to buy into his shit. And I'm like, I'm on this mission to expose Ryan Fitzpatrick. And when I say I'm on a mission, I mean like I send out a sarcastic tweet like every couple of weeks about him. But that's 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 as that's as much work as I'm gonna do. I feel comfortable with that amount of work, but I that, still that's think not, that's a lot it's of bullshit. Work. That's yeah. a lot of work. I mean you can drum it in and maybe there's an NFL GM or a scout following you somewhere on Twitter, but they might start to go, hey, that big cat's got a hell of an idea that Ryan Fitzpatrick shouldn't be in the NFL. The bigger question though is years ago when you were a lot younger before Twitter. What would you have done to try and throw Jay Feather's career under the bus, being another Ivy League quarterback <laughs> that can throw a forward pass? <laughs> does, I don't know. That's a good question. Twitter has, has enabled us to submarine bad quarterbacks <laughs> in lightning speed, and that I, I thank the, the nerds at Twitter for that. Uh, back to this game. I, I've been saying this all season long, and I've been betting the Colts over all season long. They play fast. Is this a game where you think that they can get to that 49? Because their defense isn't good either. Well, I think it's kind of correlated when you look at it. If you, you make a case for the Texans here, you think they need a more defensive-style football game. They'll try and establish the ground game, a steady dose of Arian Foster and Alfred Blue there to carry the rock. Whereas if the Colts are going to get out and do what we've seen them do at home, they're going to try and hit the Texans in the mouth, throw the deep ball, put pressure on with T.Y. Hilton, use Reggie Wayne underneath, and obviously get Kobe Fleener involved in the offense. Colts have been a great covering team, especially in the, in the, within their own division at Lucas Oil. I mean, 9-1 and one against the spread, their last 10 divisional home games. Uh, but the big story here, the Texans 0-12 in the franchise history going into Indy. But I think seven's a bit of a rich number, and the Texans know how important this game is. I, I mean, I can make a slight case for the underdog, uh, but this is a game, honestly, that I really don't want to get involved in. I feel you and I, when we shared our beers last Saturday— uh, at Aria, we got the best of the Colts, you know, taking the Browns last weekend. I'm not sure I want to fade them again here. And that was a game that the Browns should have won by, like, three touchdowns. The Colts were uh, they awful. Had, they had chances to win that game uh, so many different times, but there's a reason that maybe Brian Hoyer should be the next NFL quarterback you elect to submarine uh, and try and make sure that he never gets a chance to start anywhere as long as he remains in the league. I was I was praying that the Browns won that game so Hoyer could get up in front of the media and be like we're eight and five for a reason even though the reason <laughs> had nothing to do with Hoyer because uh, that game literally like he was he was trying to lose that game every which way while the defense was scoring you know I I think you said did you say the stat I don't know if you said the stat but I saw a stat the uh, amount of teams that have uh, have lost a game after scoring two defensive touchdowns it's like twice in the last thirty years right. Oh, I, I don't know the staff top of my head, but it's definitely a rare occurrence because more often than not, offenses aren't completely inept as the Browns were. Uh, but they took things to an all-new low. Uh, and you can thank Billy Cundiff, who he's another guy, somehow retained his job after missing 35-yard field goals, which I feel any stoolie out there could take a football to a local high school and try and put one through the uprights from 35 yards out. I, I actually think that that's my limit. I think I can hit a 35-yarder easily. That's, you think I, that's, that's a, How about yeah. 40? Like, we put money on it. Like, what kind of odds could I give you? You know, if I made you a five-to-one dog, would you be able to hit a 40-yarder, Big Cat? 
one shot? Uh, I mean, if I, I'm not going to give you best out of five because you think you can only hit okay. one shot. All I'll right, so your, do I get to warm up? I'll give you three get to warm up? You get to, you get to loosen up. Um, I don't care what the hell you want to do to loosen up. You get on the treadmill. You can use the elliptical, any of your cardio things. You can use the stupid stretching machines at the gym that only, that only you know, housewives use to get limber up before their Pilates class. And I'll actually give you three cracks to hit a 40-yarder. Okay, three cracks to hit a 40-yarder? I mean, I, I would have to put myself at, at like minus 145 to hit it because I know, I know myself. I would hit it. That's stealing. I'm taking, I'm taking the no. Now, I mean, does it matter which stadium we do it at? Would you like to kick a Camp Randall, Soldier Field, or one of the local I'll high kick, schools in the Chicago I'll, suburbs? I'll kick, I'll kick it uh, Heinz Field in that end zone that has the wind swirling that everyone always talks about. Big bad Heinz Field in, like, the south end zone or whatever it is, where everyone's like, you, they always cut to <laughs> Phil Sims being like, oh, you don't want to be kicking down here. Fuck that. I'll kick there. Come on. Give it to me. I'll go. You, make, you set it up. I'll go kick there. Yeah, you make this shit happen. We'll get one of the offshore books out there to put odds on it. We'll videotape it, and we'll live stream the hell out of that thing. Uh, it may be the most highly trafficked piece you've put out on Barstool Perfect. Chicago. Absolutely. Uh, all right, let's keep moving. Jaguars at Ravens. I think, and this might be dumb, but you can tell me if this is the feeling of the experts in Vegas. I think the Ravens are the dark horse in the AFC and the one team that could beat both the Patriots and the Broncos. Am I an idiot or am I a genius? I don't care what people say about you and what people on Twitter say. You're a genius with that uh, proclamation there, Big Cat, because at 40 to 1, Baltimore, in my opinion, offers the best value of any team in the entire NFL as far as futures are concerned. You worry about their secondary. If they had Jimmy Smith, I'd say that they can definitely beat Denver, but I think that's a bit of a troublesome matchup. They'd have to put pressure on Manning. Uh, but they've had the Patriots number in the past. They can run the football. They can slow down Gronk Gronkowski a little bit. And I think you look at the Ravens' remaining schedule, I really believe not only will they get into the AFC playoffs, obviously, but I think they end up winning the AFC North and are going to have a great opportunity to, uh, to make some waves, get to that AFC championship, and maybe be the representative in the Super Bowl down there in Glendale. And that's the worst case scenario for the Patriots because that would be the Ravens would sneak into the fourth seed, yep, and they would have to play them. That's a tough second round game. You you do if you'd rather have the Colts. I feel like the Colts, as as great as Andrew Luck is, the Colts are nothing. You can roll over the Colts in the playoffs. Oh no, for sure. And we've seen that in the past when the Colts two years ago the Ravens handled them. Last year the Patriots were able to do anything they want. I mean, you take the Colts off the carpet. Uh, in Indy, Andrew Luck's the only thing that makes them a playoff team. Sk skill position-wise, defensively, uh, they're absolutely nowhere close to any other team that's fighting for an AFC playoff picture. Unless they play Marvin Lewis and the Cincinnati Bengals, because we know the Bengals are incompetent and will shit themselves in a playoff game like they do every year with Andy Dalton as their starting quarterback. All right, so quickly, Jaguars or Ravens, gun to head? Gun to head, I'm taking Jacksonville here plus the points. I think that back door will be open all game. But here's another stat for you and uh, all the numbers guys out there. 42nd straight game that the Jacksonville Jaguars have been listed as an underdog next week would tie them for the record with the 2007 to 2009 St. Louis Rams. So at least we know we're watching futility. We're seeing history with the Blake Bortles era. That's incredible. Uh, that's, I mean, that's, I remember last year when they were like 20 point dogs in Denver and I was, I, you'd never <laughs> see that. Uh, all right. Packers at Bills. The Packers, uh, I, I love this. Everyone always is like, hey, Big Cat, Aaron Rodgers has real estate in your brain. No shit. Uh, he's the best quarterback in the NFL. He has beaten the Bears 10 gazillion times in a row. Uh, and the Packers are rolling. If the Packers were playing at Lambeau, I'd put $10 million on this game because I honestly don't think anyone can beat him there. But with all that said, they're a different team on the road, are they not? That's for sure. I mean, Green Bay plays at a much different clip offensively and defensively when they go on the highway. But before we get into this game, I actually have a serious question for you. Aaron Rodgers operates a huge chunk of real estate in Big Cat's brain. You know, is Olivia Munn starting to steal a little bit of his thunder right now? I mean, she's become that new fascination for you over there. So disappointed that Rodgers didn't get laid on game days. Yeah, well, I just thought I thought that video was funny. I thought that when she was like, I don't know, there's a lot of things that go on. It was like, is Rogers? I, I feel like Rogers gets off and he's like, oh, I'm too. I didn't shower. I'm too dirty. I don't. I don't feel so good. Like I'm too tired. He's just trying. To, I I said it. I proclaimed it when they first became a couple back in the spring. I said Aaron Rodgers cannot handle 
a woman like Olivia Munn, and this just proves it. She's literally walking around his house begging for it, and he's like, no, I don't I, – my stomach hurts. I ate too many cookies, and, like, he's pulling out all the all the stops. So that, that gives me my only joy when it comes to Aaron Rodgers, knowing that he can't handle Olivia Munn. Not saying I can. Not many men can. But the fact that he can't is giving me joy. So with all that said, I'm going to take the Bills. Am I crazy? No, you're a smart man here. Buffalo is the side of the professionals, and, and this number – uh, open five and a half. Probably would have been six had Green Bay been able to hold on to that large lead uh, in Buffalo, not backdoor Denver, which would have had the pros really running to back Buffalo in this spot. You look at this Bills team, the one thing they do exceptionally well defensively is put pressure on the quarterback, which they're going to need to do here because that's secondary. Not exactly an elite unit. I think they'll run the ball effectively enough, keep the pressure on Green Bay's defense. And Buffalo knows that every game from here on out is an elimination type scenario. I'll take the desperate dog here. The one problem, though, I would have liked the spot a hell of a lot more for Buffalo had Arizona lost to St. Louis, but Green Bay still needs to keep pace. Uh, if they're winning this one, though, it's only going to be by a field goal. And you can tell my dog has now made an entrance into the show, which happens every week. Uh, well, that's that's perfect, then. It, it's an omen that we have a live barking dog in this particular spot. Exactly. Well, not really, because she literally barks nonstop all day, so you could you could make that case for any game you ever talk about. <laughs> all right, that's, that's so... Fair. <laughs> Bucks at Panthers. Derek Anderson is back, which is, I mean, I don't even know how that how that's possible, but he's back. And I love the Panthers because of it. I don't know why. I love Derek Anderson. I'm gonna bet on Derek Anderson on Sunday. And at, at three o'clock, you're gonna be like, you're a moron. Well, Keep well, talking. Yeah. I'm going to spray you, you gotta respect any NFL quarterback that was married to a playmate at one point in his life. Anderson, to his credit, I mean, he did beat this team earlier in the year, 20 to 14, and you've seen the number adjust for it. The problem for me is from five and a half down to three, Cam Newton's worth a little bit more than two and a half points compared to Derek Anderson. You've seen a move on the under from 43 down to 41, but I think Carolina is going to treat this, you know, like a game, whether they want to rally around Cam Newton or not. Uh, I think Carolina put together a good effort. I don't have a ton of respect for anybody that Tampa trots out there at the quarterback position. You eliminate Mike Evans from the game plan if you can, and this Tampa offense is pretty pedestrian. Uh, I'll, I'll make a case for Carolina here laying the three, but not a game that I'd be running over men, women, or children to try and get to the window to bet. Uh, I love it. I'm gonna bet on the. I'm gonna bet on Derek Anderson, and if I win, I'm gonna frame it. I'm gonna frame the picture and be like, I want to bet on Derek Anderson. Uh, in 2000, in the year 2014, that's something that like, when I tell my grandkids about, they're like, no way. No, you didn't. There's no way that happened. Uh, all right. Bengals and Browns, probably the biggest game of the weekend with Johnny Manziel. First, let me say this. Let me ask you this. What do you put in your numbers for Marvin Lewis having his midget controversy? Because that has to count for something. And they brought a little person to the press conference to sit front row you can't tell me that's not worth at least the point. I've never seen a team win during a midget controversy. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, we talked about bearing a football maybe being worth one and a half points. So midget controversy probably worth one uh, on the power rating scale here. Uh, and you talk about the Browns, what this team was. We knew that Hoyer had to play well. He didn't perform at a high level. I think it makes sense to go to Johnny Manziel. But good Lord, th this dude's out partying his ass off. I can't imagine he knows the playbook, and how much is he going to improvise? He just should be thankful that Vontez Perfect is on IR, because I really think Perfect would have put him in a body bag if he had the chance to put his helmet on there. And the over-under I'm setting for, for Bengals sacks in this one, I'll make two and a half, and I guarantee that they're going to go money sign the entire way through. But from a betting standpoint, if you want to put your money on Johnny Manziel, knock yourself out, because I sure as shit ain't doing it. Uh, this actually is the only game I like the under. Is that a good play or no? Well, if you're on an under uh, on a full NFL slate, I mean, I should probably be making a case for the over because I know a blind squirrel finds a nut from time <laughs> to time, but I'm not sure I want to be on any under that Big Cat's endorsing with uh, any semblance of confidence here. That's a good point because what ends up happening is when I look at my betting card every Sunday, it's like six overs and one under, and then the one under goes over and the other ones go under. So it's what, what, what does the betting card look like? I mean, do you screenshot these things or do we have like a notebook? Do we have a little cocktail napkin, you know, for, I, from Hanger 57? Or, or what exactly does it look like that you're, you know, writing your games down each week when you're handicapping in the Chicago <laughs> Tribune or the Sun Times first thing Sunday morning? I'll tell you exactly what happens is Sunday. 
all week I think about the lines and I look at the lines and I talk about them and I'm like, oh, well, I like this. I like that. I like that. And then Sunday rolls around and I sit and I watch the pregames and at around 11.55, I just start firing. And I don't know what I'm firing on. I just start just betting the board and betting things that I didn't research and betting. So I'm, I am literally a Vegas wet dream. Like I am the epitome of why they build casinos and why they keep building tall buildings in the desert. I mean, hey, we saw a guy out here in Vegas earlier this week at a 12-team parlay for 45 G. So, you know, if it can happen to him working in the nightclub industry with his cocktail waitress girlfriend, there's no reason, Big Cat, that you can't be the next Las Vegas success story turning $15 into a $45,000 payday. I love it, and that's why I stay in the game. Uh, moving on, I'm actually going to – I know you, and Uh-oh. if you listen, it, it, Todd – has a, a podcast. He actually has a bunch of podcasts during the week. So if you want the inside word on any of the games going on, I think you even do you do uh, soccer stuff, which I bet on because it's on during the day. Uh, you can go to Todd'sTake.com and he has a bunch of podcasts. He has made it a rule, and I'm gonna respect his rule that we don't talk about the New York Jets. So <laughs> I'm gonna respect his rule, and we're gonna skip that game altogether. I I'll probably take the over. But we're going to skip that game altogether, and we're going to move right on to the Broncos Chargers. So I just want to – I want you to know that I respect your rule of not talking about the Jets. You know what? Uh, People say a lot of things about Barstool, but it's good to know that you guys respect boundaries that have been previously set uh, on other media platforms. So, yeah, that's very helpful. And you talk about the podcast for anybody who's seeing some of my work for the first time. Know that it's very different from this particular podcast. So they, (laughs) they can actually learn something from that one instead of just being entertained. Uh, but obviously a much different ebb and flow to that, a little bit more serious tone. So you're able to find a good balance between what we're doing here uh, and what I normally pop up over there uh, at Todd'sTake.com. It's good stuff, especially if you're actually trying to to bet in a smart manner and not just fire off bets like I do. Uh, all right, so Broncos at Chargers, moving on. The Chargers are minus – or the Broncos are minus four and a half. I have backed the Chargers so many times this year and been wrong every single time. So I'm going to take the Broncos, and I'm sure the Chargers will win it outright. You know what? I actually agree with you here. Uh, I think when you look at this, normally you'd want to be on the Chargers here as a home dog. Uh, But they've really struggled in this role. Two and nine against the spread in divisional home games going all the way back to 2010. And when we think about the Chargers, it's so tough to erase those visions of the teams that we saw early in the year that went up and down the field on the Seattle Seahawks. But they really haven't been a good football team. So many injuries on their offensive line. Defensively, they've been a mess. Uh, And I think Denver is going to run the football. Peyton Manning bounces back with a lot better performance than what we saw last week against Buffalo. Uh, And Denver cements their legacy in this AFC West division. Uh, I think what we saw in the Chargers Sunday night against the Patriots, uh, a recipe for what we're going to see this week against the Denver Broncos. Quickly about the Broncos. Do you buy into this whole new Broncos thing that they've been doing where they're trying to run the football and not pass the ball a million times because they know that Peyton Manning's got a noodle arm and they're not going to be able to win a game in January in that strategy? I think there's a lot to be said for it. I mean, they found a workhorse in C.J. Anderson that's been able to, uh, you know, establish the ground game. You just have to worry about, you know, the blocking. You lose a little bit going back to Julius Thomas, obviously more of a deep threat than a true blocking back like Virgil Green game and the power and the power aspect of things. Uh, but I think they want to show they can play physical football. And the most important part is it keeps their defense well rested. Uh, that defense is actually a lot better than people give them credit for. But this Denver team, I don't care how many times they run the football, they're not going to be able to go into Foxborough and win at Gillette Stadium if they have to beat the Patriots en route to getting back to this year's Super Bowl. Uh, all right, let's move on. The Vikings and Lions. Lions are seven and a half, eight point favorites. Does I, That seems like too much. Yeah, it's definitely a steep tag here. I think you look at the Vikings. Defensively, this team has shown a lot. I mean, their numbers the last couple weeks, you want to talk about misleading box scores. The Vikings are your king of it. It, What, an 87-yard screen pass in overtime, which was so like the Jets. You know, if you were sitting on a Jets ticket plus four, you were probably throwing remotes, throwing your computer, throwing TVs, whatever you could get your hands on, as long as they're not, you know, men, women, or children. Uh, and you look at the Vikings, I think, though, as a live dog, they make a lot of sense here. You've seen money coming on the under as well from 43.5 down to 41.5. Uh, I like the under if you can get it at 42 more than I want to back the Vikes. But obviously the two go hand in hand. Minnesota's going to need to establish the ground game and keep that Lions offense on the sidelines. Quickly, do you think the Lions can win a playoff game? 
Uh, I do not think the Lions can win a playoff game because I think Matthew Stafford is the poor man's Andy Dalton. Okay, that's fair. I I agree. Matthew Stafford, if he didn't have Calvin Johnson, he would be he. I mean, he wouldn't be anything. The fact that he he got paid, and people obviously say you know the Cutler contract was too much, which it was. Uh, and the Dalton contract was too much, which it was. But Stafford seems to fly under the radar just because he has Calvin Johnson. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it makes up for a lot of mistakes. The amazing part is spread the damn ball around. You got a good receiver in Golden Tate. You can get it to. You got talented running backs. Uh, but Stafford seems to be one of the biggest stubborn quarterbacks out there, forcing it into Calvin. This defense though a lot better than people give him credit for. I still worry about the secondary. Uh, but there's not a better defensive line when they're firing on all cylinders than what the Lions will throw at you on a weekly basis. Yeah, that defensive line actually scares the hell out of me. Uh, all right, 49ers, Seahawks. Seahawks minus 10. This is two teams going in the complete opposite direction. Uh, when you said the Patriots were your second best team, were the Packers your number one or were the Seahawks? I actually have Seattle. I've upgraded them to my number one team in the NFL. Green Bay it gets a little bit more awarded for them for home field advantage, so the Packers would still be favored. Uh, by you know, you're looking three, three and a half against Seattle at home. Uh, but Seattle right now, the way they're playing and the defense with Bobby Wagner back in the mix, uh, they are the team to beat, in my opinion. I'm just not sure they can go on the road to Lambeau if they have to, to win an NFC championship potentially. Uh, all right, so are you taking the Seahawks here? Because I just can't see, I can't envision the 49ers scoring more than 10 points. Yeah, I mean, well, that's a astute statement there. I actually like the 40, I'm going to go off the reservation a bit and take the 49ers team total under 14 and a half points. I, I, like think the, I think the Niners will struggle, but I'm not in the business of laying double digits, especially in a rivalry. This is an inflated number for Seattle. I mean, Christ, they were a one-point dog on the road like three weeks ago on Thanksgiving, and now i got to lay double digits here. Uh, San Francisco may have a little bit of fight, but Colin Kaepernick stinks. I think he'll run the ball more. Uh, but if San Francisco is going to keep it competitive, it wouldn't shock me if they lost 17-10, to 10, but they're not scoring more than two touchdowns. So give me that team total under 14 and a half. You finally caught on how to how to, how to cap these games in the barstool way. Colin Kaepernick stinks. That's all you need to know. He well, stinks. You throw, out, you throw out overpaid quarterbacks. I mean, if you're going to do a ranking, Stafford, Kaepernick, Cutler. I mean, how do we I, or, how do we rank these guys right now? I like Colin Kaepernick too. Like I was a believer in him because when he gets out of the pocket, you can't stop him. He's a playmaker, but he has lost everything. Like he, he, I feel like he's completely lost his confidence, and he just stinks. He stinks. Yeah, I mean, he's got – there's some serious issues going on there in San Francisco. Obviously, Coach Harbaugh would be shocked if he was back. Um, but Cap's got to get his head on straight, and I'm not sure this is the kind of defense to do it against. Worst case scenario, though, he'll walk in there with solid headphones, and he can listen to enough aloe black to get himself in the mood <laughs> to get his ass handed to him by the Seahawks for the second time in a few weeks. Love it. Uh, all right, Sunday night, this actually will be an awesome game, uh, pr- basically for the NFC East. Cowboys and Eagles. Eagles are minus – Three, three and a half. Do you have three and a half? Yeah, I mean, if you shop around right now, I mean, you should be able to find a three and a half if you want to bet the dog here and definitely, you know, only lay three if you want to be the favorite. I'm not sure what you guys have for a sports book policy. I'm not sure if you and, uh, you know, Portnoy get off the podcast and start booking all of your viewers' action on the side so you offer up whatever numbers you want or you encourage them to actually shop around for numbers and be astute sports better when it comes down to it. Well, I, I, I absolutely want... I absolutely uh, encourage people to shop around and find better numbers. Shut up! <laughs> this is the fun part of the podcast. Hey, I mean, things are going off the rails. And, I mean, if you're getting up, I'm turning on some lights. I feel like I'm sitting in a dungeon as it's starting to pour outside my office. It's it's raining in Vegas? It's raining. I mean, there's nasty storms in Southern California. It's supposed to be cold here this weekend. I mean, this isn't, oh, the, kind of bullshit that I, this isn't the kind of bullshit I bargained for moving out here to the desert. For you, uh, what we were what were you we just talking about? We were talking about oh, shopping books. Yeah, so I I do I shop lines. I have three different books, but it usually ends up the reason I have three different books is because I'm trying to chase you know I'm trying to run from one of my bookies. So that's that's a different reason for why I have three different books. But yes, that's shopping fair. lines is the right thing to do. So no, there's definitely a couple numbers out there, and, and you look this series. The interesting part about it is it's been dominated by the road team. Uh, the road teams won six out of the last seven. We saw Philadelphia and you know annihilate Dallas on Thanksgiving in that particular spot. I'm not sure the Cowboys can do a lot of things that much differently than you know what they were able to do then, but I think the offense will look a little bit better. Philadelphia's defense clearly the better of those two units, and I have a slight lean towards Philadelphia. Uh, but you talk about all the playoff implications. Uh, this is a game I'd watch 
or you know, find the sports gambling version of crack cocaine, which is basically live betting. Maybe you'll get an opportunity to try and get involved one way or the other there. I, uh, I've had Philly fans kind of down my throat this year because I think they're a fraud team. And every time they play a good team, they lose. Do you think that they can win a playoff game? I do think Philly can win a playoff game. I think the defense is actually underrated, but they're going to have to establish the ground game. I don't want Mark Sanchez flinging the ball around 35 times a game if I'm Philly. So if McCoy gets bottled up and they can't get the ball to Sproles in space, it could spell disaster. But, uh, you know, this Philly team I actually like a lot more than some. I just don't think they're good enough to beat the elite teams in the NFC, your Packers, uh, your Seahawks, uh, and teams, teams built along those lines. Uh, that's good to hear because I, I honestly haven't been able to bet on the Eagles once, so maybe I'll do it this week and the Cowboys will probably win by double digits. Uh, let's go to Monday night. The Bears are a mess. I After that report came out last night, I bet on the Saints. And I, 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 I never, ever bet against the Bears. I never, ever do it. But this Bears team is such a dumpster fire that if I'm going to sit and watch them, I might as well win some money. I don't think there's any chance they're going to beat the Saints. The The whole thing is just an absolute disaster. The coaches are a disaster. The offensive coordinator is a disaster. The quarterback and the wide receivers are a disaster. Brandon Marshall's out. The defense can't tackle anyone. The defensive coordinator is the worst defensive coordinator in the world. The Bears stink from top to bottom. Who do you like in this game? Well, you know what? I think the best quote of the week, I think it was John Clayton who said that uh, – you know, most teams try and employ a 4-3 normally schematically, but the Bears play a 4-0 because they really don't have a linebacker that's worth a damn anywhere on the field right now in terms of making tackles in that second level. But you look at this Bears team, they've actually done real well as a franchise on Monday nights, 8-2-1 and one against the spread there, but clearly the Bears had uh, much better players for a lot of those 11 games. They've struggled as a home underdog. The Saints actually playing better football on the road. Scary to lay points with them on the road, but the only way to look at this game is to lay the points with the Saints. You figure the Bears have quit. You know the Bears will put up points in garbage time, which makes any Bear player you have on the roster a great play for fantasy purposes. But you know Cutler and Forte won't do a damn thing in the first half. They'll only do it when they're down 28-7 to in the middle of the third quarter like they did Thursday night against the Cowboys. All right, so we're on the same page with that one. Now let's go to we got to do our locks of the week. Hank, do you have your lock? Hank? I think Hank's falling asleep on us. No, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> uh, I like the Saints also. Okay, so Hank's Hank's lock is the Saints. I am going to take the Browns solely based on the midget controversy. Got You never, ever lose a midget controversy game. And, Todd, who's your lock of the week? I'm gonna take Buffalo, uh, and we'll call it we'll call it four and a half. I'll take the Bills here. Uh, all that Aaron Rodgers hatred that you've spewed throughout the course of the podcast, you know, uh, my jealousy of him that he gets to go home to Olivia Munn, and I get to go home to you know prostitutes and or whatever the <laughs> hell else I can find out, out, out here in the desert. So it's a little bit different, but you know, go you go back to it. Aaron Rodgers has to feel a bit threatened. I mean, Don Kiefer is one hell of a man that's going after Olivia Munn for the season finale on Sunday night. So. That that's a good point. Uh, and now my last question to you: I think I found a hole in Vegas. I found a loophole. I'm a genius, like we've already established. I'm I'm dying to hear this. I'm dying to hear this nugget that you're going to close this podcast with. Here, if it's a get rich quick scheme, I got yep. my uh, notes over here. I'm going to start scribbling it down as you okay. speak. All right, here we go. The uh, odds on one of my books for the national championship, I have Alabama minus 110. I took Alabama big. They're going to beat Ohio State. Would you agree with me on that fact? I agree. I think Alabama beats Ohio State. Now, what's the line going to be when Alabama plays Oregon? Well, I think Florida State's got a shot to beat Oregon, so you'll get a better number there. But you're looking at Alabama, and perception's going to play a huge role. Right now, Alabama will be about a a three-and-a-half, four-point favorite against the Ducks. But if Alabama blows out Ohio State and Oregon squeaks by Florida State, uh, you could get a little bit more of an inflated number there. So I'm sitting on my minus 110 going into the going into the final game. Now Alabama's minus 180 or whatever against whoever they're playing, and the other guy's plus 150. I got myself a nice nice hole right there, right? Did I not just find – did I not just bankrupt Vegas? <laughs> you got yourself a little bit of a scalp there. But, I mean, you have three books. You should be able to play open parlay. So just use the Alabama money line – as the first leg in game one and see if those will give you better odds and land a dollar ten uh potentially. But I, I think that you're on you're on to something. It's not fail proof because Ohio State will show up for that bowl game. They'll try to compete 
with the Crimson Tide, but uh, you do have a discounted price there with Alabama, especially if they're a four-point favorite against the Ducks or maybe even higher than that. Here's what's going to end up happening is I have this fail-proof method here to make a lot of money, and what's going to happen is Ohio State's going to come out, and they're going to come out with their hair on fire, and they're going to get up on Alabama, and I'm going to freak out, and I'm going to live bet Ohio State. Oh, we know, we know Alabama's this. We know yeah. this is happening. It's definitely what's going to happen. Yeah, here. and then Alabama's going to come back and win that game. So I'm going to lose. I'm going to lose, lose there. And then in the championship game, I'm probably not even going to hedge because I'm like, oh no, Alabama will definitely win. And then Oregon or Florida State will beat them. That sounds about right. I mean, that sounds like the fail-proof gambler strategy right there. That you're going in with a game plan that you'll completely veer away from after one drive when Cardale Instant. Jones th- throws a jump ball uh, and somebody comes down with it. You know against all odds, and that Ohio State receiving core, and then Alabama boat races in 56-7. to seven. No one overreacts to the first drive of a game better than I do. That's just a fact. That's a skill in, in and of itself. I mean, it's definitely a skill. Now, if you get to the point where you're able to bet against your first instinct, then you may have the ultimate money-making strategy that you can share with all of your loyal fan club that's out there. I did that this year. I did I did my Costanza picks where I went against all my gut, and it went 11-1 and one, one week. So and why'd you go away from it? Because then I did it the next week and it went like one and eleven. So uh, it and it's like fair. this is how it works with gambling. You, you, I I can't tell you how many times I've figured it out and obviously I haven't. So he is Todd Furman. You can find him at Todd Furman or Todd'sTake.com. Todd, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate you actually giving us some semblance of a real show and real knowledge about the betting world. Uh, good luck. I, I'm going to take the Bills as well. I would say everyone should probably take the Bills and not the Browns and the Saints, who Hank and I have picked for our mortal locks. The the over the over under on hate tweets I'm going to get from stoolies around the country of Aaron Rodgers starts this game with a 21 nothing lead because I mean I know you guys have your fervent fan base and people are not afraid to come attack me if I give out bad gambling advice. You think yeah, it's the stoolies. The stoolies will never let you forget if you make a bad bet. So just expect that. And uh, we'll pray. Everyone will be praying for Todd on Sunday. Thanks, thanks, man. That was awesome. Hey, Thanks, appreciate Todd. you. Appreciate you inviting me on, man. Happy to uh, fill in for uh, Mr. Portnoy. Where is uh, Dave this week? Where is he, Hank? Uh, he's in New York. He has a meeting with Director. Oh yeah, that's right.